I'm going to share just a little bit this morning, kind of an intro, some introductory material about Mark, um, give us some stuff to think about, about some of kind of the overarching themes in Mark, and hopefully give you some things to be challenged by and think through and really look at your life um, over the next week as we gear up to continue going on this journey in Mark. And in a sense, I think Jesus is calling each of us to come follow him. Um, on this journey of learning from his example, um, because we have it, right? We have it written down. We have this story that Mark so graciously gave to us um, in this written form, and we have it. And so we can actually follow Christ's example as well, just as those disciples did. And we have Christ's spirit, the comforter, the advocate living within us, among us, in our community, in our hearts. And so we also have Jesus with us as we follow um, in his example. You know, two weeks ago, we started the series on Mark, and we looked at this story um, in the very first chapter, um, just a few verses before the story today. Um, And we looked at this story. Do you remember what it was? It was about Jesus' baptism in the Jordan River by John the Baptist. It's a very fascinating, uh, dramatic story. So imagine this with me, okay? They're out in the desert. Masses of poor, struggling, weary Jews went out to the desert to hear John the Baptist preaching and teaching them this these uncomfortable truths, right? John was preaching pretty challenging messages, all right? You think that um, sometimes a sermon nowadays can be kind of provoking or make you uncomfortable or challenge you. Like, I mean, I, John the Baptist, he was really upset in people sometimes when he was preaching. And, and they needed to hear his message, though. He was speaking these uncomfortable truths. And one of the things that he was doing is he was calling out and exposing the cultural myths of his day that were being propagated and spread by the Roman Empire and the Jewish elite. And and he was calling this stuff out and, and speaking truth in times of lies and deception. He truly was a prophet. And many of these struggling Jews who were out there in the wilderness listening to John the Baptist, many of them very likely had revolution and uprising on their minds, wondering if it was time for a movement of change. You may not know this, but there were stirrings of revolution all throughout Palestine during that time. One of the members of the crowd that day, right there among the masses of poor, struggling, weary Jews, was this man uh, from Nazareth, a day laborer from Nazareth. And he was there that day when John was baptizing. And he came forward from the crowd to be baptized. And John saw him come forward and knew who he was. He knew that Jesus was the one that they had been waiting for. He knew Jesus was stronger than he was. And he knew that Jesus really was the one who needed to baptize John. But Jesus came forward in an act of solidarity with all the other struggling Jews that were there to be baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan. It was his initiation, his Um, coming out party in a way of saying, I am the one. I am the one that you've been waiting for and something new is happening among us. He made it, uh, John um, told everybody in that moment that this is the one. This Nazarene is the one that we've been waiting for. And so John baptized Jesus. And, And when Jesus came up out of the water, Um, It says that the heavens were torn open, that a voice from heaven boomed, you know, and spoke these words of affirmation over Jesus, and then Jesus was possessed and then driven by the Spirit. Jesus was declared in that moment to be the Son of God, or you could say the most human human, the human that embodies what humanity was created to be. The writer of this story, the man that we know as Mark, sets up a dramatic introduction to his book. 
It's dramatic, right? And it's signaling this invasion of God into dangerous territory. And even though evil lurks in every corner of the Gospel of Mark, we know from the beginning that Jesus is stronger and that his story is good news and that he is the one we must follow. One thing we must remember when we read a story like this one from the Bible is that there are two worlds represented in this story. And this may seem very simple, but it's very important to pay attention to. There are two worlds. There is the world that Mark narrates about Jesus. So Jesus' world, the disciples, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, what Jesus was experiencing. But then there's also the world in which Mark lives, because Mark was not writing this during Jesus' life. He wrote it many years later. And so Mark was experiencing lots of things in his world, which would impact the way he tells the story, what he thinks his audience needs to hear. And so you have the story, the, the world of Jesus, and you have the world of Mark. And it's important to recognize this. And as we study the gospel, we're gonna learn about both worlds. Today, I'm not going to get into too much of it, but I do want to say that Mark likely wrote his gospel. We don't know 100%, but there's a good chance he wrote his gospel around A.D. 66 to A.D. 70, somewhere maybe in that four-year or so time frame. Y'all may know what happened in A.D. 70, but that was a monumental event uh, for the Jewish people. Uh, I mean, it's like... Israel's 9-11, potentially, it's a very important event for them. The temple was destroyed by the Roman military. And so what was happening in those events, years leading up to AD 70, during this time Mark would have likely written this gospel, is that there was this strong Jewish uprising, a violent uprising taking place, and then there became a very intense Roman backlash to the uprising. Jesus had died many years before. Uh, Stories of Jesus uh, were being told through their oral tradition. Um, They didn't write a lot down, right? They, They told stories through the oral tradition. It was a very strong oral tradition. But for some reason, Mark, during this time, decided that he wanted to get these stories cemented in writing. So in Mark's world, in AD 66 to AD 70, around that time, There was intense division, conflict, and violence among the Jews and the Romans. Many competing factions of Jews were fighting with each other, um, and, and it was really people at the top vying for power, power over the temple, uh, power over kind of the Jerusalem um, power structure. So there was a lot of fighting among the people at the top of the Jewish kind of hierarchy. But there was also stirrings of revolution and uprising um, among the Jews against the Romans because they were tired of being occupied. There were these bandits, um, we could call them kind of Robin Hood type people, um, who were stealing from the wealthy elites. There were the people uh, called the Jewish Sicarii and others like them who were involved in assassinations and violent resistance. Um, They were known for slitting the throats of these powerful people, and and it was a very tumultuous time. And during this time, the stories of Jesus were, you know, they were percolating through the area, and you had these traveling preachers and evangelists who were going around sharing the stories of the oral tradition of Jesus. And perhaps what might have happened is many of these folks were maybe telling slightly different stories or maybe adjusting their stories to fit their agendas or maybe their political outlook about what was going on. And in these confusing and chaotic times, Mark decided for some reason he wanted to get this story down in writing. Perhaps he heard the oral traditions that were being shared and realized, all right, there's a lot of stuff being told and we need to get this story about Jesus, down, documented, and preserved, right? It's just too important. You know, the interesting thing is not many people actually wrote down stories like this. 
Um, and you, it's a pretty obvious reason. It's because it was expensive to write things on, on paper. Um, it would not have been easily accept, accessible to common people um, because most people couldn't read. And so writing down these stories, it just wasn't super practical, right? But Mark decided to write it down anyway. And he wrote it down not, not just to preserve it, but I believe he wrote it down because he wanted this story to stand the test of time and be able to teach and challenge people to follow Jesus in their own context for generation and generation after generation. Not just for the people during his time, but for generation after generation after generation. This story has stood the test of time, and this story is for us also. Thank Thank God that Mark wrote it down, right? And that the Spirit led him to do this. Many believe Mark was the first gospel. It's, it's almost com- universally accepted that he wrote his before Matthew and Luke and John. And so thank goodness Mark decided to do this because we have it now. Last week I told you what I believe to be Mark's purpose in writing this down, why he decided to do this. And and here's what I think is the basic reason. He wanted to inspire and teach people how to follow Jesus. You know, Mark was not so concerned with, you'll notice if you actually read the gospel, Mark is not so concerned with these heady thoughts or wise sayings. He doesn't go on extended times of pontificating on what the cross means. There is a time and place for that, and we have that in the Bible. We need it, right? But not in Mark's gospel. The gospel of Mark is really about the way a person lives their life. That is what Mark is concerned about. It's not as much about believing all the right things and having it all in order. No, it's about how do you live your life? Are you living like Jesus? Are you following him? That's Mark's unique contribution to the the canon of the New Testament. He wanted to challenge people to be radical disciples of Jesus of Nazareth in their daily lives. Another thing you need to understand about Mark, and this is fascinating to me, it's a very strange and unique work of literature. His book is, is similar to some literary genres of that time, but the reality is The Mark's story is a very unique genre of literature. It's its own thing. Mark is just like a very creative thing he came up with. It's like I like to go to art museums. When Laura and I travel, we always like to find an art museum in every city or town we go to. And and often when you go to art museums, you'll go into a room and look at a piece of art and you're like, wow, I've never seen anything like that before. I've had that experience when you go in the dark room and they have a video playing and I'm like, I've never seen a video like that one before, right? And and that's kind of what Mark's story was. It was so powerful, the story of Jesus, so earth shattering, so mind blowing that Mark literally had to create his own genre of literature to tell it. He came up with a gospel. He made this up because he needed a unique way to be able to tell his story, right? It is a unique genre of literature. His book is very similar to biographies during the ancient, uh, in the ancient Near East and, and antiquity. It's similar maybe to a hero narrative where Jesus would be the hero. But like Christina told us last week in our Wonder Room story, it's very different from other hero narratives during antiquity. His characters are not from Uh, the elite classes, uh, like almost all other literature during that time. One thing that is very unique about Mark that I am very thankful for, that Mark's characters are normal folk. They are just normal people. And and these are the kinds of folks that never make it, 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 didn't make it into the sacred stories. And this would make Mark's story relatable to his audience. Because the normal folk would have heard it read to them in in their community when they would hear this gospel, and they would think, man, I understand that. I know what it's like to be a fisherman. Oh, yeah, I know about 
those folks. I know about going out into the wilderness to get away from kind of the dangerous, uh, powerful center and trying to hear a message of hope. Like they would understand, they would know about having to go to the temple and, and give kind of the last bit of money you have, right? Because the temple was kind of taking advantage of people financially. They would understand these stories. And this made it so relatable. Remember, Mark wants, he wanted his audience to understand the story. He wants us to be able to live it out in day-to-day life. And so the fact that it is full of normal people is very powerful and important. Ched Myers, a brilliant uh, New Testament scholar, um, has given a subtitle to this book. He, he's called it a manifesto for Christian discipleship. And, and a manifesto is basically a public declaration, right? It's a public declaration of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And so if you want to know how to follow Jesus in a world full of lies and confusion and violence and propaganda and oppression and domination, I encourage you to read this story. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to read this story. We're going to study this story. We're going to study the world of Mark so that we can learn how to be better disciples. How do we follow Jesus today? I want to offer up uh, just three kind of subplots that we find throughout Mark. And this will help us because we have the overarching plot, right, about Jesus and the overarching gospel message of Jesus' boundary-breaking mission in the world. But there are kind of subplots that we're going to see over and over again as we read through it. And, and when I read the Gospel of Mark a few years ago from front, start to finish in one sitting, I did it two times in a row because I was assigned to in seminary. I encourage you to do the same thing. Um, but I noticed all these subplots as well as I read through it. I remember them from years ago because they come up over and over and over again. And so I want to offer these up to you. Um, to think about. Um, and, and we will come back to these each, each and every week, probably, just to be honest. Um, so the first subplot is this. Here's the first uh, subplot. Jesus's creation of a new community. He created this new community by calling disciples. And so one thing you're going to notice in this first subplot is Jesus's interaction with his disciples. Throughout the book, you're going to see Jesus calling disciples, teaching disciples, correcting disciples, being let down by disciples. He spends time with them. He develops close, intimate relationships with them. He does important transformational work with them. His disciples will profoundly miss the point and let him down. Mark doesn't glamorize the disciples. They are very relatable characters to us. So you're going to see this. There's this subplot of the disciples and Jesus' formation of community around his disciples. And it's not just the 12 disciples that you read about, um, the 12 men, but there are women, there are children, there are other disciples as well who are part of this group that are following Jesus each and every day. And Jesus is forming a new community through this kind of ragtag, ordinary group of people. So that's the first subplot. The second subplot is this, Jesus's mission to the crowds. So we have disciples, and we have crowds. Jesus' mission to the crowds is another subplot you're going to see. There are crowds everywhere in Mark. The crowds follow Jesus. The crowds abandon Jesus. The crowds um, demand things of Jesus. The crowds are amazed by Jesus. The crowds are healed and ministered to by Jesus. The crowds are kind of their own character that you're going to find throughout Mark. And and I noticed this when I, when I read through Mark, when I read through it in one sitting, I noticed that the crowds are mentioned over and over and over again. They are mentioned 38 times in this gospel. And the crowds, really what they represent is this teeming mass of poor and oppressed people that followed Jesus around, were so attracted to what he was offering. Jesus shows them compassion. He feeds them when they're hungry. He heals their sicknesses. He exercises demons from them. He teaches them. 
But ultimately, at the end, the crowds end up rejecting Jesus. And the crowds, that moment where they choose Barabbas to be released instead of Jesus, it's a powerful and and sad moment for, for Jesus. The crowds can be very fickle, just like today the crowds can also be very fickle, right? And so the third subplot, we've gone through two. So we had the creation of new community through disciples. We have Jesus' mission to the crowds. And now the third subplot we're going to see time and time again is Jesus' confrontation with the powers, which we see represented in his interaction with the authorities. And primarily what we're finding here is, is Jewish authorities, that Jesus is interacting with, but but many of the Jewish authorities had aligned themselves with the Roman authorities as well. And you got to understand too, back then there wasn't this di- uh, distinction or division between church and state like we like we have today. It was all kind of wrapped up together. And so when we talk about the religious authorities, that was also a political authority that they had as well. The powers in Mark that we read about are the Pharisees, the scribes, the Herodians, and the Sadducees. And you will see these characters over and over and over again. And I'll tell you, Jesus does not get along with them very well. These religious and political leaders consistently were oppressing the majority of Israel while taking care of kind of this elite few Jesus isn't having a problem with all the Jews. He's having a problem with the Jews that were in authority and that were hurting and oppressing their people. And Jesus had many conflicts with them all throughout the gospel. There's so much conflict and confrontation. Some people, a lot of people actually believe that the Bible has nothing to do with politics or how we organize society. And and that the gospel's not political at all. And and one thing I would want you to think about, if that's where your mind's at right now, is think about why would Jesus have so much conflict with the political and the religious authorities if if his message and his witness was not political at all, right? No, Jesus was challenging them, and not just challenging their hearts, but challenging the way society was set up. And there's Subtle things that we don't often pick up on reading it so far removed, but we're going to get into some of that and see some of the, even the political dimension of the gospel and why did the authorities get so upset with Jesus? Why did they want to kill him so early on, even in his ministry? I mean, Jesus was not just playing nice, right? Jesus was saying and doing things that challenged their authority and power. So we have stories of Jesus' intimate relationship with his disciples, his mission to the crowds, and his conflict with the authorities. And we will see as we move throughout the gospel that if we want to live a life shaped by Jesus, then we must incorporate these aspects of his life into our own life. He's giving us an example. These three distinct aspects of his life can serve as a model for us as we try to discern how to live like him. So I just want to offer up three questions for you to think about um, related to these three subplots, and I want you to reflect on these. And I'd love for you to come join us tomorrow to talk about what God is saying to you and, and which one of these maybe you feel like you need to work on in your own life. But think about these three questions. I borrowed them from a guy named Reverend Sam Wells, and I think they're profound questions. So first... If we're going to be like Jesus, we need to be part of a group of disciples. All right, we're going to come back to that question at the bottom in just a moment. But like Jesus, we too need to be part of a group of disciples. Like those first disciples that we learned about in our Wonder Room story this morning, we are also called by Jesus into diverse, intimate relationships of trust, accountability, sharing, and shared mission and purpose. And this is often really hard to find, right? But we need it. I think a lot of us have friends in our life, but here's the question. Are we in close relationship to other disciples who are seeking to follow Jesus in their day-to-day lives? Serious-minded people 
who have mission and purpose to the way that they're living and want to follow Christ. I remember when I was in my teens and early 20s, I had this thought, it it hit me a few times, but I just, every now and then I'd think, man, like, all I do with my friends is goof off. All we do is make fun of each other and play games. Like, there's there's got to be more uh, to friendship than this, right? So I want to ask you, do you have close relationships with other serious-minded disciples who are seeking to follow Jesus in their day-to-day lives? Perhaps many of our issues right now in our society and in our nation are uh, among the church and among Christians is that so many church people don't have accountable, close relationships with other serious-minded Christians. And so here's the question to ask yourself this morning. Am I part of a group of disciples in any meaningful sense? And one option for that could be a small group. And I'll tell you, small group's not going to be easy. You're not going to enter into a small group here at our church and immediately click. It's going to take work. It's going to take honesty and courage. But we need to be in a group of serious-minded Christians who are seeking to follow Jesus. So the second thing I want to say to you is, is like Jesus, and I'm saying this to myself too, we need to also be with the crowds. We need to also be with the crowds like Jesus was. And, and we're with the crowds by building friendships across boundaries, particularly with the poor and the oppressed. Jesus intentionally built friendships and reached out to people on the margins. And you'll see it. He went out to the margins, the places other people stayed away from. He went there and built friendships and connection and called those folks to follow him. And like Jesus' time, We also have kind of clear boundaries on on who's in and who's out. We have boundaries that our culture enforces on who we're supposed to spend time with. I think many people lack empathy and compassion for the oppressed because they do not have any friends who experience oppression. And so they don't understand it and aren't seeking out to understand it. People have figured out that there's power in proximity being close to people, being close to people will change your perspective. It's changed my life. Um, proximity to, to folks different than me have transformed me. One thing I lament about this pandemic that I mentioned earlier in our service is that it has prevented us from building those friendships across boundaries. Embrace has been a unique place that has provided that opportunity for us to do that. And we have to be so much more intentional with this online stuff to be able to do that. And so I'm, I'm longing for that day when we can come back together. But I want you to ask yourself this question. Do I have friendships with people very different from myself? And am I allowing those friendships to change me? Am I allowing those friendships to change me? So we need to be uh, in part of a group of disciples like Jesus. We also, like Jesus, need to be with the crowds. And then finally, the last one is this. Like Jesus, we need to confront the oppressive powers of our day. And I'll come back to that question at the, in a moment. But there are new versions uh, today of the Pharisees, of the scribes, the Herodians, the Sadducees in our own context. There are authorities and powers who lie to us, Uh, with myths of domination and and use their power to hurt others and keep people down um, and to build up themselves. Sadly, even the local church can be an oppressive power sometimes. (laughs) So many people have come to me and told me that they've come out of very oppressive church environments in their past. And if we're committed to the way of Jesus, then then it's just going to happen. We will indeed have confrontation with oppressive powers if we're truly following Jesus. Martin Luther King Jr., John Lewis, many others, and all the folks who are part of the freedom movement are a testimony to that. And when we take stock of our relationship with the powerful, I think uh, this question that Reverend Wells offers is, is important. Does the shape of my life reflect my longing to see God set people free? And do I challenge those who keep others in slavery. And, and it might be first taking a look at yourself. 
because you might be part of that power structure that's keeping others down. But that's an important thing for us to be thinking about. And this is something that comes up over and over in Mark. I think that we got to rediscover the roots of our faith. And the roots of our faith are the story of Jesus of Nazareth. And Mark tells it in such a profound way. We need to rediscover what I think Mark is showing us is the radical Jesus. And now radical, don't get scared by that word radical. Because radical Really, what it means is to the root. That's the essence of that word radical. It's the word means to the root, to the essence, to the core, to the beginning. The radical Jesus is the original Jesus. And that's who we need to rediscover, the original Jesus, the one that we read about in Scripture, not the Jesus that's been kind of whitewashed and, and, and just sanitized and No, we need to recover the original Jesus. His example of building accountable, mission-focused community, his example of friendship with the poor, and his example of challenge to the powerful will lead us to deeper discipleship if we're willing to follow him along that way. When Jesus called the first disciples, he invited them on, on what I like to think of as a discipleship adventure. A discipleship adventure of leaving behind the old way of death and bondage and walking in a new way of life, which is freedom and love and life and connection. Mark's gospel, uh, when it was written, it spoke words of hope and challenge to its original audience of these new struggling Christians. And Mark's gospel still speaks to us today. And so I hope that, that we can all join together and go on this discipleship adventure and, and learn more fully what it means to be a follower of Jesus. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.